not only a judge for the case competition, but also a final keynote speaker of today's conference. Jeff is an inventor of many technologies, an entrepreneur behind many startups, and a game changer for the Canadian healthcare and commercialization landscape. Combining a strong academic background and an in-depth understanding in technology transfer, he has been dedicating his career to transforming research ideas into real value and making life worth living. Let's welcome Jeff on stage to share his stories on Tackle Big Problems with Elegant and Affordable Solutions. Thank you very much. Um, what a pleasure it is, it is to be here today. Um, do you want to punch up me onto the screen here? Thank you. So tackle big problems with elegant and affordable, affordable solutions. So the topic that was given to me, so I'll try and aspire to it. Um, so there are going to be three parts to the presentation. What is IDAT? Uh, we're all talking about IDAT. What is the mission, which I think is important. And then I'm going to talk about the IDAT way. The way we do things. The way we take things from inventions to commercial solutions. We're part of UHN. UHN, just to clarify for you, has, has four hospitals. It's a huge organization. It's a $2 billion operation. Um, there are three minor hospitals in it. Princess Margaret, Toronto General, and Toronto Western. And then one very important hospital, Toronto Rehabilitation Institute. We, uh, we look after the others and we're guiding the general direction of the others. They haven't quite worked that out yet. So Toronto Rehab, which is the home of IDAP, has um, 30 or so full-time scientists, lots of adjunct scientists, has about 240 students, graduate students, plus a lot of volunteers, and about 100 staff. And what I think is really important is its multidisciplinary nature. A third of those students are engineering and computer science, and a half are from clinical backgrounds, and the wedge are from business and management studies. And it's that, it's that combination that is going to make us really the leaders in the world. And when it comes to funding, Unlike other research groups, we don't just rely on grants and we don't just rely on donations. We're building the commercial arm. We're having a lot of success at the moment. It's early days, but we're enjoying considerable success. And I believe this is what people want. People want our research to actually be applied to help others. People also want our research to generate jobs and wealth in a country. We're, I mean, our mandate is to improve healthcare. Let me tell you, when I travel to poor economies in the world, I'm scared of getting sick. So, wealth and health go very much together. So it's not at all contradictory that as a healthcare organization, we'd be interested in creating wealth. It does those two things for us. If you want to live a long time, earn a lot of money. Because the correlation between wealth and health is very strong. But it also, through commercialization, allows us to get the results into the hands of people that can use it. So let's talk about the mission. The mission we have is to solve big problems. To solve them. We're not a research group that's very happy to describe you know, I go to gerontological conferences where people tell me interesting things about growing old. Uh, elderly people find the report that more of their friends die. Um, they report being lonelier. Um, they report that they can't run as fast. All sorts of ridiculous thoughts, right? Um, so we need to solve those problems, not describe.
describe them. We solve them in, in, by doing three things. We create evidence for policy change. That's a rather unpopular thing to do in Canada at the moment. But there was a time, and there is in some jurisdictions a time, where political decisions, policy decisions, are based on evidence. That's a very useful thing to do. We develop new treatments to help people get better. And we develop technologies that we commercialize either in the form of products, most commonly, or perhaps services to, to support people. That's what we do. Our defined scope also includes three things. It includes prevention. You might say, well, you're a rehabilitation center. What are you doing in prevention? Well, I can tell you the topic today of infection, preventing infections. When I was asked about that, my response was a lot of our patients are at risk of catching the infections, and if they die, rehabilitation is pretty good. So, so we try to keep people out of hospitals, stop them having road accidents, having falls, having back injuries, catching infections. That's a primary objective. And it ought to be, of all healthcare research, if you think about it, a significant portion of the time should be in preventing, not in solving problems. The second part, the part that everyone recognizes as rehabilitation, is returning people. If you are unfortunate enough to end up in a hospital, one of our partner junior hospitals, Princess Margaret or Toronto General or Toronto Western or any other, with an illness or, a, or an injury of some sort, it's our job, after they've saved your life, to come up with a treatment that gets you back to home, to the work, social life so that life is worth living. That's our goal. And finally, all of us growing up in our homes, gathering around us, our memorabilia, having the kids visit, having our toys around us, none of us really, when we get older, want to end up in 200 square feet of a nursing home room with a single cupboard. We all want to continue to live together at home, in our own communities. That's the third objective. So, what stops professors commercializing their inventions? And, by the way, I need to just say professors, I could say students as well, because a lot of them are led by students. What stops in academic life? Two equations. The first equation is that security and advancement equals number of papers plus number of grants. I can tell you that that's absolutely still true. And when you look at a CV, and you're looking for an appointment in academia, the first thing you do is you go through and you count the number of papers, and you see the number of years, and you look at the number of grants, and that's the benchmark. You look beyond that, but that's the benchmark. Well, at least some people look beyond it, some don't. That's the benchmark. So that has nothing to do with commercialization. That's the antithesis of it. The second equation is that in the university setting, until such progressive places come across, are available as the hatchery, for example, which is beginning to disturb the process, until then, you go through this process. You invent something, and you then sort of are hands-off. You disclose it. And that disclosure piece of paper goes off to some organization called the Technology Transfer Office. And there, it sort of dies. Um, you sort of are told you're a good person, you don't understand business, and you just wait for them to find someone to license it. They're not really very interested in what you've invented. Um, in fact, in my case, one time, we were presenting to a company in, in Sweden that something that they were, they were rather interested in, and the person from the Technology Transfer Office was fast asleep um, throughout the process. Um, so it's not, generally they're not terribly interested. They're motivated to get licensing dollars. But you know what? Licensing sucks. It really does suck. I mean, we've got to move from licensing, as has been the theme today. We've got to move 
from licensing to startups, because we've got to start generating wealth and jobs at home, not just licensing it off to a multinational that may or may not use it. So the IDAPT way is what I'm talking about. It's a rather grand name for something that we're still working on, I admit. But it's beginning to gain currency. It's beginning to work rather well. And the IDAP way has to begin somewhere. And our last group of three presenters, and it's easy to imagine them sitting in these three chairs here, talk a lot about this. And what they said had a ring of truth. It really did. The IDAP way, you've got to... The first thing you've got to do is you really want to create a startup with a disruptive technology. And you'll see one paper that uh, Tillak Dutta, who's the back, the back of the room, found for me, um, showed that at Stanford in 2009, 37% of disruptive innovations succeeded to be commercialized, only 6% of incremental. So we need something that's really going to make a difference not something that improves things a bit. We've got the odds stacked against us anyway in doing startups, so let's do something wild. However, don't let the licensing people put you off. Don't let them say, oh, there, there, good boy, good girl, you just carry on, we'll license it for you. Point out to them that in fact, startups have generated six times more, and I don't know in the, in the last year what it is, more revenues for the university, let alone for the inventors, than licensing to established companies. Startups is the way to go for everyone. It's risky, but then so is licensing. If you get a license agreement, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get revenues to speak of, and you can ask me about that. So we have a process. We have a process that we follow as the IDAP way, beginning with concept development, which is down that bottom corner there. And we, this is an iterative process. It's a process that I'm going to, I've taken a minute, let me just check. I'm going to talk about how you come up with the idea as they did. But once you've come up with the idea, ideas are worth almost nothing. But they were exactly right. I, I, I don't rate ideas at nothing. I rate them at 10 cents each. Um, really, 10 cents seems a very good value. If I put 10 of you around for a half an hour, you'll come up, come up with 10 good ideas, and you'll have earned a dollar. I'll hand you the dollar, and you'll have to break it up into 10 cents each. Because the idea means nothing. It's only when it's turned into something tangible that people can swallow, sit on, ride on, throw at each other, hold, evaluate, that it has any value. That's a really important thing to understand, and students often don't grasp that. Ideas are worth nothing. You've got to put the work in to get them. So the INET way is all about that. It's about coming up with the idea and then evaluating. Now, we happen to use simulators for evaluation. We found that that accelerates the process of evaluating ideas in our field. We have seven simulators at the moment, and we're building an eight. And they simulate every different kind of environment. And we'll come back to this in a minute. So we go and we evaluate the idea in a simulator. And the first time, it's always a failure. And we have to rework the idea or come up with a different idea. And we go through that little circle over and over again until we're confident enough that we've got something safe enough, something respectable enough to evaluate in the real world. Then it goes off to an evaluation in the real world, and then it goes out as a commercial process. Throughout all of this, of course, we have to document it because eventually we're going to have to get regulatory approval. So how do we choose the idea that we're going to work on? I haven't called it an idea. I've called it an opportunity. I haven't called it a problem. I've called it an opportunity. Because there are any number of problems out there 
the problem of people who perhaps can't move very well. They've lost all their nerve systems. And then they might be a, a, a severe quadriplegic, for example. Well, it would be lovely for them, for us to develop an anti-gravity system so that they could float around and visit everyone and all their friends. But if I don't identify an opportunity, I'm not going to stand here or stand next to the wall and bash my head against the wall for the next five years. I have to come up with an idea and an opportunity together and think, aha, I can solve that problem. The problem and the opportunity come together. And then I have to check I've got the resource to do it. So let me take you back to when I first came to Canada, which seems a long time ago. But I, I arrived in 1973 on a sailing ship. Um, not true. Um, but I finished my PhD in Scotland. And supposing I had come, instead of to do medical technology, suppose I had come to do office technology. And suppose I had followed what every good MBA is taught, and what every business student I imagine is taught, and that is I had pulled together a focus group of all the office managers, all the office people I could find because they really know what they need. And I had sat them around in a circle, and I had done good analysis, followed all the proper qualitative methods to analyze their results. I would have found that they told me I needed to develop a better typewriter, because it was hard on the fingers, and every time it hit the end of the line, it made that annoying bell. And at the very least, they would like a different ring, a customizable ring. They would have also told me the carbon paper that they're using to produce multiple copies comes off black on their fingers. And they would like a carbon paper that came off with a sweet smell and no, didn't stay in their clothes. So I might have decided to do that. And moreover, they would have pointed to this lovely lady who comes around with the cart all the time with the mail twice a day puts the mail on their desk, and then they, of all things, have to open the mail with a tear it apart and, and record where the address came from and everything, and hold it open on the table, and then reply to it. So they'd have liked to convey about it, that delivered the mail directly to their desk, had a slicer there that opened it and presented it to me. Not a single one, I bet, would have come up with the need for a personal because they did not know that technology existed. So they did not recognize, although they recognized the problem, they did not recognize the opportunity that was there. Very important. Now, Steve Jobs, I just finished reading his, his um, biography. And one of the last things he said before he died in an interview was when he was asked how he listens to his consumers. He said he doesn't. He has no interest in listening to his consumers. He's an objectionable guy in many ways. But he, had, he said, I'm not interested in listening to consumers. Because they'll tell me what they want. I have to, tell, I have to determine what they will want in the future. It's like this puck thing. You, know, you don't skate to where the puck is now. You skate to where it's going. And in fact, he also paraphrased Henry Ford. And Henry Ford, he said, once said that if he had listened to his consumers, he would have spent his life developing a faster horse. So the IDAP way, the other key thing which we all agree on is multidisciplinarity. And that's the beauty of today. The idea that this room has people from engineering, people from business, people from neuroscience, chemistry, several others that I've met. It's the coming together of those different disciplines that is galvanizing. Let me tell you also that whenever I've come up with something really innovative, it's usually been in the first month that I go into a new area. So I went into orthopedics, and six months later came up with an artificial spinal disc. People thought it, at that time that was a ridiculous idea. Couldn't be done. Went into urology, and we came up with a new approach to looking at urology in seniors. 
there's the various other examples. One recently we went into sleep and we've come up with something which is going to revolutionize sleep, sleep testing, but it's happening. It's in those first days when before you learn that your, your solution is impossible, that's when you succeed. And it's when you bring together people from different disciplines, that's how it works. We need, in our facility, we have extensive prototyping facilities, modern prototyping facilities, because remember the idea that's worth 10 cents? It's not worth it until we turn it into something. And the way we turn it into something is to use modern prototyping facilities. 3D printing, particularly, has been an enormous success for that. Industrial designers. I'm going to give industrial designers a plug. I'm an engineer. Industrial designers know how to design things. Engineers do not. Engineers know how to make them so they won't break. They know how to make them so they'll work. But industrial designers know how to put them together so people will want to use them and know how to use them. And industrial designers know how to come up with prototypes and illustrations of prototypes. Absolutely key. I believe simulators. If we develop something, and we want to test it. We were recently, last year we were developing something for helicopter pilots on another, in another area. If every time we wanted to test that thing in a helicopter, we had to go through about a year's worth of safety testing and proving, and then we had to go to extraordinary lengths, and then we had to get the helicopter time, and it just wouldn't happen. If I have a helicopter simulator, I can do it almost instantly. And we can experiment with it in every way and get to the answer. You'll see some other simulators in a minute. Now, why is this guy being so arrogant and saying that you can develop something without talking to your customers and consumers? I did not say that. I said that the original idea you develop, the need that you want to solve, the opportunity, you have to come up with that opportunity. However, once you've first made the first concept, you've got to reality check with consumers. Is this a good idea? Is this going to work for you or not? And it's only by working around this set, this check, and validating what you're doing that you'll come up with something in the end that will be useful. The next step I've now learnt, because the business team tell me, is that a business team is essential. And I believe it is. I think that there are other skills in assessing potential that's useful. Obviously, you must protect your intellectual property. You launch a startup, that's easier than done. The IDEP way is to launch it and spend as little money as possible. We incubate you. You live with us. You don't pay a lot of rent to start with. You are charged the rent. We let you be a little bit delinquent. Eventually, we collect them all, but we help you every way to get started. We do the tooling in China. You've all got parents in China, thank God, who've got connections where we can make an injection molded tool for a couple of thousand bucks. Um, and, and so we can get the product out of the prototyping stage. These are some of the recent companies. I'll show you a little bit. I'm going to, show, I'm going to cut this short, short because we're running a little late. But the simulators that we have range from a simulation of a house, a home on the 12th floor with the roof cut off. You can walk around the top and you can try things out in there. Um, this is a product that detects if you've fallen without you having to wear anything. And calls, <laughs> and calls for help. <laughs> it's probably good in there. There's some other products through there, which I'm going to skate by. I, I really don't want to talk about products at the moment. We're talking about things. You know, fundamentally, I've always been interested in things that are not necessarily very sexy. <laughs> you know, there was a time when you could respectively walk around the Institute of Biomedical, Biomedical and Biomedical Engineering, and they wouldn't mind me saying this when I first came here, unless you were continually publishing paper, papers that were a mathematical analysis of three-dimensional ultrasound fields. Then it graduated, it was respectable to develop robots, especially if they were brain controlled. And they really looked down on developing technologies. 
Now, now, people are grasping that you don't have to be an idiot to select something which is as fundamental as a toilet. In fact, you have to, you have to be rather bright because there are very few alternatives. Otherwise, they'd have come up with them a long time ago. If you can come up with a, a device that helps someone do something that's really essential in their lives and it's practical and it's low cost, you need to use the best brain power, the best technology to solve that. I find it easier to develop a sophisticated robot than it is to develop a toilet accessory. Sometimes. So it's not, don't get, don't get, don't get seduced by this idea of high tech. People who made a lot of money have made them making nails, by the way. And if you can make a better nail, you'll make a lot of money. So this, this is a very important area. One of the most successful products that we ever made was from raising, increasing the height of a toilet. Because people can't get on and off it. And by having a piece of plastic under the toilet that fits all toilets, and I had to analyze 85 different footprints of toilets in North America and come up with the geometry that would work, that avoids the embarrassment and the unsafe conditions of a, of a raised toilet, for example. This is another simulator. It's the care, care lab. It simulates a hospital lab. And we do, obviously, a, we do describe problems in order to solve them. This is, um, again, to, to like studying the forces required to lift someone out of a bed. And then we get our creative juices going, and I will let this play. Um, this is uh, one of the inventions that we came up with rec recently, lateral thinking. It's now about to be a product. We've tested hundreds of them, but it actually puts straps under people, however heavy they are, without having to roll them, and all the weights involved, and there's no friction. So you can squirt them underneath them, and then you can lift them. We think we can, we're looking forward to rescuing a whale off a beach. We're certainly going to be testing it more with cattle soon. And then when you want to pull the strap out, you just pull it lightly. And it comes out without any, any friction at all because it turns inside out. Oh, let's move on from that, he says, confidently. You can list lots of people. <laughs> this is Winter Lab. This is simulator number six. We simulate winter, it's been on the news a lot lately. Um, this is another actual lab that we have, but it's proof of point. When you go out, this winter a lot of people have had injured hips, broken hips, broken wrists, head injuries. Huge, of the rate of three an hour in greater Toronto area with serious injuries because, because of these wet and icy conditions that we have, just people falling over. This is the most expensive boot you can buy from this particular manufacturer. It is a boot that will take you to the North Pole, according to them. <laughs> and it looks very aggressive, and it looks perfect, and you'll spend a lot of money on it. But when you go and buy your footwear for next winter, you will be disappointed, probably. Because the footwear does not behave according to its look and its name and its market. So we've actually developed methods of, um, of testing. Here's, a, here's a, a winter environment which Susan is just causing to go into a, to create a particular hill. So inside this environment we've got ice. We can adjust the temperature. We can add snow. We can make it a windy, snowy hill if we want. And we can take and we can see whether you can walk up and down the hill, which turns out to be a very valid way of measuring the performance of footwear. So we're now persuading the footwear industry to bring their products to us before next year so we can give them a score, an angle of a hill that people will be able to go up under different conditions, and then they can choose whether they market using that information or not. And that will be a business for us. And it'll also be a lead-in to us developing new footwear that we're working on with the materials. So, I'll, the sort of thing, hang on, here's, here's me. Um, 
walking up and down different, a hill testing out a particular boot. There's a robot that protects me and a mattress. They think I'm worth protecting. I don't know. <laughs> now look, here I am at seven degrees with this boot. I'm having some trouble. <laughs> and it doesn't matter who's wearing the boot. The result comes out at seven degrees pretty much every time, except for Dan in our group who can't walk up anything. I'm not quite sure what's wrong with Dan. But, but he may cause a real false statistical problem. But the rest of us can walk the same angle in whatever boot. Okay. Let's walk. Oh, I'm going to wear ice. We'll go past that. Okay, so I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to move past this product, which is an interesting product, and I'm going to finish up with this. <laughs> Why am I finishing this when I'm talking to a Chinese, well, a Chinese father, a lot of people who look at the, their families came from China. Why am I talking about this when I'm talking about the IDAPT way? Well, I tell you, there are two unsung heroes in this room. Actually, there are three, but there are two that I'm singing to today who have made a huge contribution to the IDAP play, who I describe as Chinese warlords, Promise and Gavin. Would you stand? <laughs> They are the key to the success of the Chinese, of the, of the, of the IDAP way. They are, I understand, the driving force behind this magnificent conference today, and I'd like to finish on that note. Thank you.
at least four worthwhile papers a year. And they have to bring in a couple of major graphs. So that occupies all of their time. If they start to try to commercialize something, that's all their career. They get no credit. So that's what I would say. I don't think professors are reluctant to share their knowledge. I think that some people, as was pointed out by Joseph and his team here, believe that ideas they've got to keep them for themselves because they have value and they're absolutely wrong. They, they have no value at all. And unless they share them with some people who can actually turn those ideas into something meaningful, tangible, they'll, they'll, they'll just go off back. Bye. Oh, of course, there's diff different personalities. You, you, I mean, this room is full of people who are eager to commercialize them. You can see it in faces, you can see that they're animated, they're interested in doing this. If we took a cross section of everyone from the university, quite appropriately, we would have a lot of people who would be very bored. Um, we don't all have to be the same. We don't all have to want to commercialize. We don't all have to want to create. Um, in fact, if we did, we wouldn't have any people to hire as employees, would we? So, my sister used to start lots of companies. My sister was an engineer, and my, I remember her talking to my dad on Christmas with a wet background. And, uh, and she was an engineer as well. And I was sort of hanging around in the next room, and I could overhear them. And, and uh, so dad said, well, do you do any engineering any longer? And she said, Oh, yes, she said, I hire lots of engineers. They're very useful people to have around. <laughs> so. uh, I, have, I have another question for you. So you have mentioned industrial designers. But in some cases, people do not see the value of industrial designers. They, they just think they, uh, they are helping others build models. They are helping others shape different their existing products. Uh, but uh, actually, you are include uh, industrial designers in your team, and now there's really community and big data on how industrial designers improve their environment. They are work. So how do you see the future career of industrial designers in the coming decades? Well, you know something? Um, our, one of our best and most senior industrial designers is now a PhD student here. He's now doing a PhD while he's an industrial designer with us. Another industrial designer Go through an apprenticeship program in the machine, in, in uh, machine, uh, as a machinist. So that he could not only adapt to industrial design, but he'd be better at the industrial design and being able to translate into a manufactured product. Um, this is Stephen, who's an industrial designer, is getting his PhD so he can understand the process of moving from research to policy. I don't see any limitation at all. But if people have business skills and they're prepared to learn some engineering and some clinical skills with us is great. If people have artistic skills and manual skills, I, I value manual skills very highly, craft skills very highly, and they learn to be industrial designers and they want to be researchers and they want to become engineers or clinicians, it's all fine. No value. 